Hi, I'm Jeffrey Rickman, and this is my channel, Plain Spoken. If this is your first time watching anything I've done, um, my project is as a conservative in the United Methodist Church trying to talk through things that uh, a lot of people are not talking well through. Um, I think uh, we have a lot of concerns of disinformation and a lot of power struggle going on right now, and I, I think it's important to talk well and think through things better than um, is commonly being done. So I, uh, I recorded this yesterday, or on this topic yesterday, and I, I didn't really like the job that I did. I was a little too emotionally charged, and so I wanted to take another stab at it today. Um, what I'm talking about is uh, an article put out by Levitt Weems, and yes, I did report on another article from him this last Friday, if you saw that. He wrote an article called uh, Disobedience Didn't Start with Sexuality Debate, and I took issue with um, his assessment of whether or not sexuality is core and key uh, to the church. Um, but the larger issue I'm having with Mr. Weems is that he seems to be presenting um, what I think some would be calling uh, misinformation, and, and that's, if I understand the definition of misinformation, it's information that is factually true but unhelpful and presented from a certain slant that doesn't give a very um, accurate picture of what's actually going on. Um, so the, the way that I would present this uh, on the front end is just to show you this uh, Facebook post that I saw uh, yesterday morning now from Jeremy Smith. He's, of course, the administrator of the United Methodist Clergy page. He's also uh, got a blog called Hacking Christianity. He's, uh, if it goes further left than Jeremy, I don't know what it looks like. I like Jeremy personally, but um, Jeremy, uh, well, let's just look at what he says. Unsurprising conclusions, but helpful to remind everyone that the disaffiliating churches are overwhelmingly in the South with majority white memberships. They're also more likely to have a male pastor and are less likely to have an active elder as pastor. The last one is the least surprising to me in the data point we've seen a lot in recent months. So this, uh, Jeremy is not the only person who picked this up. This made the rounds all over uh, social media yesterday. It is even, as I should be able to show here quickly, on the front page of the UM News website. Now, UM News uh, did not report at all on the revival that took place at a Wesleyan seminary over the last month. They linked to one article from uh, the Kentucky Annual Conference, but the day or two days after the article was re released by the Lewis Center for Church Leadership, their report sheds light on disaffiliating uh, churches article came out. And this is what the article looks like, and I'll quote from it um, in a little bit. So this is, this is Mr. Weems here. And going back to my critique on Friday, I didn't even address the larger concern that he brings up. Now, he does say that he, uh, he lifts up these historical examples of uh, ecclesial disobedience in the church, not as a recommendation for what should be done, but he makes the case that um, when the general conference steps out of line and makes rules that it doesn't have the moral authority to make, that churches are right to disobey um, those things. So um, I disagreed with that. I think if if you you have to enforce the laws that are on the books, you know, and once again we're going to see that a lot of this mirrors the left right divide in our country's politics. It, it gets superimposed on our um, politics in the country or in the denomination. But the thing is, the United Methodist heritage started off very differently than where it is now. The way it started off was anything that was on our books was enforced by John Wesley, and that meant that whenever he went from society to society, um, massive amounts of people would be kicked out every time. Not every time. And in many places he went, sometimes as much as a quarter, even a third of the members were kicked out because they were not abiding by the general rules. And that's what made Methodism stand for something. It had a quality control measure in place. The thing is, we expanded this book of discipline very big and then um, made it so that it was kind of impossible to enforce everything. And then, moreover, we just allowed for ecclesial disobedience. So uh, with slavery, that's the very first example he uses. We should not have allowed slaveholders to be Methodists. And the fact that we allowed them to do so is what sowed the seeds of discontent for centuries. Now, what we've seen in the Methodist movement is not a functional dynamic. It's a dysfunctional 
uh, series of ecclesiastical disobedience and split off, and now we're seeing the latest iteration of that. It's almost as though we refuse to learn from the past, and we keep banging our heads against this approach that does not work. It creates misery. So I would consider Weems's article um, on ecclesial disobedience to be misinformation, because the undergirding premise is that it's harmless, that it's in keeping with Methodist tradition, um, that it has a place in the denomination. I think that presupposition is problematic and can't really be sustained when you look at other movements that do have quality control. Um, the, the thing with this article, and I do want to turn to the article now at the Lewis Center for Church Leadership, it's called uh, Report on Disaffiliating United Methodist Churches Through 2022, Comparing Similarities and Differences. The thing that I would, I would want to sum this up from the beginning is I think that this is a big I think the technical term is nothing burger. Um, there is not much here. I double underlined one portion here I would highlight. There are more similarities than differences in comparing the cohort of disaffiliating churches with the total pool of all United Methodist churches. He, uh, what he does is he does not, even though he uses the word overwhelmingly twice, he does not highlight huge statistical differences. He highlights small statistical differences that then get blown out of proportion. Why would they get blown out of proportion? Here's, here's the, the big theory that I'm presenting here. It's because it sit, fits very comfortably into tropes that cultural elites have of flyover country people. Um, Hillary Clinton, of course, called them deplorables. We're associating the people who are disaffiliating here with Trump voters um, and with people who uh, the Southern strategy catered to. So this is made into an issue of race. So uh, one thing that you see in American politics is rather than take uh, critiques from the right seriously, oftentimes the left simply says, well, you're a bunch of racists, so we don't have to consider what you say. Um, this was seen um, most recently, I think, in uh, journalists trying to explain why it was that they didn't take the lab leak hypothesis seriously. Well, it's something that Donald Trump promoted, that the Republicans promoted. We couldn't seriously be asked to entertain this. Um, so what I think is happening here is a, a, is a kind of um, gentle move towards uh, party lines, partisan thinking, where, um, you know, first what they were saying is, oh, nobody is going to leave. Well, now more churches and people are leaving than they thought were going to leave. So now they're going to say, oh, the only people leaving are racist. Oh, the only people leaving are these these people, these deplorables. Um, that this is what disaffiliation is for. It's not for the rank and file, normal United Methodists. Um, so I think that this is a bid on people to dismiss disaffiliation as something that conscientious or responsible or respectable or faithful disciples would want to do. And so it goes down the line um, of this article. Um, and and let's, um, I got my buddy TJ here, Mike, just in case he needs to correct me on this. Yesterday when I recorded this, he was uh, thinking it's important that we start off with with hard numbers and, and what the data set looks like. So uh, 2019, 2020, we're working with these numbers. In 2019, there were 30,541 total United Methodist churches in the United Methodist, uh, in the United States. We were able to identify the names of 1,967 disaffiliating churches representing 6.6% of total churches, and we examine three aspects for comparison. So, so far, it looks like 6.6% of total churches have gone through the disaffiliation process in the United States. Um, there's going to be more. Uh, we've got a whole year ahead, and it's hard to say. Uh, I've seen estimates of like 2,000, 2,000 to 4,000 churches uh, disaffiliating. So they look at pastoral leadership characteristics, congregational characteristics, and location characteristics. And once again, just got to highlight, there are more similarities than differences. We're not looking at um, one, one very clearly defined segment of the church exiting. We're looking at a lot of diversity here. Now, there is some variety, and I'm going to address some of that, but in my mind, that is becoming vile. <laughs> you know, in 2 Corinthians, as Paul talks about becoming vile because of the, the uh, accusations of his detractors, his enemies, and he hates to engage on those terms. Um, that's how I feel about this. I think that this way of thinking is reductive. I think it's um, 
racist definitionally um, to to act as though by virtue of one's skin color they are more inclined to make certain decisions. I think is really problematic, um, but also it creates um, it participates in this worldview of elitism where the elites live in certain areas, the right-thinking people live in certain areas, and uh, the deplorables live in other areas. And the place that this classism thing starts is with the the clergy status thing. So um, I sent this to a statistician named Lyman Stone yesterday. I follow him on Twitter, and uh, he's a Lutheran. He has a passion for denominational stuff. And um, I showed him this data set, and he said, uh, well, it's not surprising. First off, I said, okay, so... It's not surprising that um, white Midwestern males are more conservative than uh, the rest of the population. He said, yeah. I said, okay, well, even given that stereotype, would you agree that the data points really don't show a lot of difference here, that it's really not an extreme difference between white male, lower educated Midwesterners and the rest of them? He said, oh, yeah, 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 it's not a it's not a big gap here. It's it's uh, he did not say nothing burger. That's my word. Nothing burger. Um, but what you'll notice is that these track very closely. Yes, there are slightly more elders that are disaffiliating. Yes, there are, uh, no, slightly more elders that are staying, slightly more part-time local pastors that are disaffiliating. The rest is pretty much equal. This is a very slight thing, but this is, you saw the thing that Jeremy Smith was least uh, surprised by, and that's because it participates in this trope that higher educated people make better decisions. One of the things that I think you do see in politics recently is that the right is more and more skeptical of institutions and experts, and the left is more and more trusting of institutions and experts. And I do think this is borne out in the data. I do think this is what we're seeing here. Um, now, to infer that that is for lack of intelligence, I think, is the problem here. Um, to correlate intelligence with higher education, I think, is a, is a classist correlation that... Um, that does not serve us well in this particular conversation. I thought what would serve us well is to remember Junius Dotson, um, who passed a couple of years ago. He was the head of our discipleship in the United Methodist Church. He critiqued this sort of mentality that higher education was needed for good ministry, and he directly tracked the decline of Methodism with the rise of higher education regulation in our denomination. So that's something worth considering. Something else else worth considering in this is that whenever you've been, when you are a full-time ordained elder, all of your life is tied up in the denomination, and you're giving up a lot more personally and professionally when you leave. So the incentive structure is to stay if you're a United Methodist clergy. So a lot of this incentive, when you're talking about finances primarily, but also when you're talking about work connections and interpersonal networking, the incentive is to stay. I actually find it remarkable that the the percentage of ordained elders disaffiliating is this high. That says to me that it's become so detestable to so many of them that they have to get out regardless of the financial cost and the, the professional cost. Now, when we look at the clergy gender going down here, he had some bar graphs. I thought it would be helpful to have actual numbers. Um, so within... Um, all United Methodist churches in 2019, this is male clergy and female clergy. We had more than 21,000 male clergy, more than 8,000 female clergy. So there's already a disparity there. Um, now, one can look at that and say racism, as Cosro has for several years. There's a lot of interesting study that I've, I've heard about through Jordan B. Peterson talking about how even though there's a lot more in common between men and women, there are differences. You know, this kind of comes down to a foundational, do you believe that men and women are different in any way, or are they exactly the same, just with just different anatomy? And then when you look at personality studies, one of the things shown is that women score much higher on agreeableness, more generally, than men do. Men are more willing to be disagreeable. So that uh, would be my theory as to why there are more men in ministry. Ministry is a, a, a job that requires you to be disagreeable, but also for those who are in ministry, to go through the disaffiliation process requires you to be disagreeable, requires you to push really hard sometimes and have people look at you angrily and speak to you angrily. But even so, I think it says something that, okay, so the number of uh, 
Okay, so we have total males over 21,000, total females over 8,000. And then when you look at who has led these congregations as they've disaffiliated, 1,600 have been male, 340 almost are female. And that's not insignificant. You know, this is not a male-only thing. This is, uh, you know, these, these numbers still largely track, but they just, uh, there, there is some difference. And I, I, I don't think it has to be um, only, you know, bullheaded, bigoted men want to do this, and some women have been uh, cajoled into being racist like them. I think it's just uh, our theological convictions put us in a place to make hard decisions, and, um, and there are, you know, men are, are more willing to make hard decisions, at least in this category, it would seem so far. I would be very interested in seeing this data set at the close of 2023. I'd be interested to see if this changes. The clergy age is pretty much, I mean, that's not worth talking about, I don't think. But then we have this overwhelming word again. Overwhelmingly, racial and ethnic majority churches are not represented in the disaffiliation thing. Um, when you look at the total number of churches, we in the United Methodist Church, I just extrapolated from this. I didn't find it on a, a different data set. There are 3,176 uh, non-white churches and then 27,365 white churches. So listen, if we're going to use the word overwhelmingly here, I think it would properly apply, apply to the, the denomination more generally. We are an overwhelmingly white, older, upper-class denomination when compared against the general American public. It's been that way for a long time. It doesn't look like it's changing. No matter who you put at the top of the structure, uh, people of color do not seem to think that the United Methodist Church is an attractive option for them. Um, now, when we look at the breakdown of which churches have disaffiliated, yes, the vast majority have been white, over 1,900. But what do we do with these 53 churches for people of color? Um, I, I think that 53 matters. Um, and I, I think what is inclined to happen right here is something I've seen the left do sometimes where there is the right position to take if you are gay or if you're black. And if you don't take that position, then as President Biden said, you ain't black, you know. Um, I don't think that we get to say what the black position is or the white position is. I think, fine, let's look at the, the slight disparity that we see um, here, but also realize that there are cultural things at play with black churches that are not at play with white churches. Um, cultural norms uh, have a role to play in group dynamics. So I spoke with my friend Odell Horn. Before you do that, yeah. one thing I want to bring up. Please um, do. What, <clears throat> what are they considering a majority white? Like, is that 51% or is it like 75%? It seems like they're taking 51%. So you've got, say, 51% of a church is white. Well, 49% is people of color. Yeah. But that would be considered majority white. It would. So what are they what, what what how are they determining what that is? It doesn't it doesn't actually say. Yeah, and I I don't I don't know the answer to that. I just know the vast majority of churches don't have anything close to a 50-50 mix. Um the vast majority of churches are either white churches or black churches because of cultural norms associated with both. Um and I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America, um, and that that still holds true. You know, even though uh, laws have changed, and we're trying to find a, a colorblind society, um, people still group with affinity, and that has to do with culture. Um, and I think it's actually getting worse now with the rise of anti-racism. Um, there's a, an intentional creation of black spaces now instead of trying to 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 work together. Um, when I talked to Odell. Um, I did an interview with him, and if you haven't seen it, you should look it up. O Odell's a, a wonderful person. Um, I, I said, help me speak intelligently about this. And first thing he said was, um, he said, go to that, that quote from Reverend Love and Deborah Bass. They're the chair and vice chair of the Caucus of Black Methodists for Church Renewal uh, in the United Methodist Church. Um, this is in that article that was written up on the Lewis Center report. Um, the, they said... Um, African-American churches are not of one mind about issues that have divided the denomination. 
He said, Odell said, that statement right there means that the black churches are not necessarily in line with the United Methodist um, direction that things are going. Um, the rest of the quote here, but have a longstanding vital commitment to pushing the United Methodist Church forward on race relations. So what, what, what I think Odell would say, uh, well, how about I say it and don't put words in his mouth, is that when you're looking at black caucus groups, generally they're not sympathetic with the left-leaning cause of the bureaucracy, but they are committed to this cause of helping the institution be less racist. Uh, they said move forward on race relations. That's a better way to say it. Um, so they don't want to give up on that mission to minister to the United Methodist Church. So they're between a rock and a hard place. Do I stay with this denomination that represents my theology less and less, or do I leave this, this mission I'm committed to? Hypothetically, entertain that as one reason why black churches have been a little bit less willing to disaffiliate on the front end. Another factor would be, uh, if you saw my interview with Odell Horn, he says that black folks are not early adopters uh, generally. They're not operating from a place of, of privilege where they feel like they can... Well, okay, so he said that part. What I would say is black uh, groups often don't feel like they're operating from a place of privilege where they can easily uh, leave commitments like that. Um, and so that's, it's a much more... They, they entertain that with much more gravity than, uh, say, white folks with, with more privilege would. So um, the only other thing I think I would focus on is 40 churches, black churches, have still disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church. That needs to be reckoned with. I, I, don't, I don't think this number is going to stay the same. Um, when we look at congregational size, uh, it, it tracks... One thing I would say about that is I'm very aware in many of annual conf many annual conferences of conference bureaucracies coming down much harder on larger, richer churches to disaffiliate than smaller, poorer churches. Uh, uh, I, in fact, I would say there isn't a single annual conference I've heard of that is treating large, rich churches the same as poor, uh, rural churches. Um, I'm inclined to think that the the representation of larger, richer churches would be higher on this were it not for um, annual conferences standing in the way. When you look at growth and decline, that largely tracks. The location thing, I just thought was kind of blatantly um, tapping into that Trump flyover country uh, deplorables thing. Um, and and I, part of the reason I feel that way is this, this blue part of the pie chart is three jurisdictions all put together. So Western jurisdiction, North Central jurisdiction, and Northeastern jurisdiction are all put together in blue. And then you have the Southeastern jurisdiction and South Central jurisdiction given their own piece of the pies. All right, so yellow is South Central, green is Southeastern, and then... Um, you have UM churches by jurisdictions. I looked up how many churches, the numbers of churches. In um, South Central, you have 5,192. In Southeastern, you have 10,689. And in the other three, you have 14,660 churches. And then it shows that the blue is really underrepresented, and then the yellow and green are really overrepresented. Now, what else tracks on to this? Well, conservative theology. What all this, all I think this shows is that conservatives, you know, uh, uh, all this really could be is making the generalization. If you want to just make the generalization that uh, conservative churches are more eager to disaffiliate than less conservative churches, I think you could just write duh across this. Like, of course, the incentives are not in place for conservatives to stay. Now, I think a lot of this just maps on to. Where is conservatism? Except I think that black churches are more conservative than this reflects. I think that is, uh, yeah, and I think we've known that female clergy are less conservative than male clergy generally. So, yeah, maybe that's the thing that this all comes down to. Um, I was curious, though, if average church size changes uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, I also kind of thought it was worth entertaining. 
that liberal uh, bishops in liberal jurisdictions are probably more reluctant to do disaffiliation than bishops in conservative jurisdictions where there's more momentum uh, towards the door. Um, I, I just think that this sort of study easily reinforced stereotypes and did not allow for like nuanced or like <laughs> like 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 helpful thinking. You know, I think it just helped people lean on their their constructs that they were comfortable with rather than kind of reckoning with like, man, we really have made this a hostile place for conservatives. So I, I think I think the thing that's reflected in this, you know, as I see this reposted by all these people in different places online, I think what they think they're doing is reinforcing, I, I got this correct cultural stereotype about the people who voted for Trump. When I, What I think it's actually showing is conservatives are seeing the writing on the wall and trying to get out and managing it despite lots of different uh, challenges in their way. And on their way out the door, what we're seeing is liberals uh, mock them and dismiss them by saying, oh yeah, you fit into this unflattering, uncharitable box I've already got for you. So I, I, uh, I don't know how most conservatives receive this. I saw a couple people post and try and argue with it. I just thought it would be helpful to go through some of the numbers and try and engage it more thoughtfully and, and entertain the notion. Here's, here's the theory I want to end on, and I, I covered this in my... Um, I covered... I did three episodes on the jurisdictional um, conferences and the... Well, the resolutions, the three resolutions that they all passed, and just how much liberal ideology is in each of the three. Um, anyone paying attention to that, anyone paying attention to the signaling here, I think should see that there is no conservative voice in mainstream United Methodist anymore. They see themselves as using uncharged, uncoded language, but they betray very much the mentality, mindset, ideology that they have. It's hostile towards people like me. Yeah, I think on on uh, the article, one of the notes that I made is um, I, I, I'm under the impression that the primary jurisdictions paying uh, apportionments are the ones that are leaving. Um, I think I saw I, I saw a presentation by Joseph DiPaolo yesterday saying that GCFA is projecting that they're going to lose 36% of their revenue over the next few years because of disaffiliations. Um, <laughs> the, the financial thing going on here is the denomination is taking money from these richer, larger uh, southern and mid midwestern churches and using that to advocate against them and their values uh, through the, the general boards and agencies. Um, conservatives are tired of being taken advantage of in that way. They're tired of being threatened if they don't pay their apportionments or called disloyal. They're, they're tired of funding culture warriors that are against them and who hate them. And so as we see this kind of open um, hatred towards conservatives within the denomination, yeah, they're leaving. And what I think they're trying to do is saying, oh, this is just what the hateful bigots do um, and maybe they'll they'll con some churches into not entertaining that, um, even though it'd be a good fit for them to leave, by just saying, "Hey, you don't want to be with those Trump voters, do you? Oh, you don't want to be with those those awful white guys in Mid America. You could do that, and maybe you'll fool some people. But in the end, I think what you're doing is um, accelerating the division culturally between us, not just in the denomination, but in the country. Um, I think this sort of thing is just irresponsible, and um, I'm just sad at the way it's being treated at this stage in the game where we're we're all seeing how divided we are. So many of our leaders continuing to actively divide the denomination in this way is, um, I don't know, deplorable. Let's end on that note. I'll see you next time.